we're excited to welcome those who have not. So this is our monthly historic, le historic Cartersville Lecture Series. I am Jessica Bierman. I'm the Executive Director here at the Museum. Tonight we have Jennifer Bauer here. She's going to talk to you guys about Maynard Theater Field that was out in Winston-Salem and give you a little history on that. So save your questions to the end. We'll have a question and answer session at the very last part. And she does have a few of her books on display in the other room. So if you're interested at the end of this, which I'm sure everyone will be, you can head over there and see what she's got to offer. So welcome. Thank you. Tell you, Maynard Field. Yes, it was in Winston, but it's closer. <laughs> Does that count? <laughs> well, I am absolutely delighted to be here this evening. I am always, always eager to share the story of Maynard Field because not a lot of people know about it, and it's a very special, special place, and it was very important to our state's history. So I'm very, very glad that all of you have come out to hear about it. Today, an airplane in flight is a common sight. The sound of its engines is as familiar as a songbird. Will people no longer bound outside when they hear its roar or cast their eyes skyward in hope of seeing the man-made wonder? But in 1919, just the opposite was true. Most North Carolinians had never even seen an airplane, and its approach evoked excitement and, in some cases, fear. Now, Levy Smith was 10 years old in the summer of 1919, and while playing on her father's farm, which was located off Kernsville Road in Winston, she heard an unfamiliar sound in the distance. Well, at the same time, her older brother came running out of the house, and he shouted, Run! Levy, run! There's an airplane coming, and it's going to land on your head. <laughs> <laughs> well, terrified, she ran inside and crouched beside her bed. But after several long minutes and no apparent crash, well, Levy realized that her brother had tricked her, and she missed seeing her very first airplane. But little did she know that her days would soon be filled with the comings and goings of those newfangled flying machines. You see, before the end of World War I, the Winston-Salem Board of Trade realized that attracting aviation industries to their city could be a very profitable venture. So in 1918, the board tried to attract an aviation company, but it couldn't because they didn't have an adequate airfield. Well, the city's need for an airfield became even more evident in September when James Kukendall, who was the secretary and treasurer of the board, well, he learned that flyers were willing to pay $10 a day to land on an adequate airfield. He also heard that an airmail route was going to be established between Washington, D.C. and Atlanta, Georgia, and that a midway stopping point was needed in North Carolina. Well, without an airfield, Winston-Salem wouldn't prosper from any of those deals. So eager to remedy the situation, well, the board set out to establish a first-class flying field, an airfield that would be the first of its kind in the state. So, in October 1919, the board leased 35 acres of land off of Kernsville Road from William P. Stockton. Well, located approximately seven miles from the center of Winston-Salem, the land partially bordered the farm of John R. Smith, and that was Little Levy's dad. Well, articles of incorporation for the Winston-Salem Aviation Company were drawn, and the task of preparing the airfield was underway. Enthusiastic volunteers all around the city they gave their time, their money, and their resources to ensure that that field would be ready if the air mail road became a reality. So by the end of November, the United States government had approved Winston-Salem's new commercial airfield. The Board of Trade named the field in honor of Lieutenant Belvin W. Maynard, who was a pioneer aviator and a native of North Carolina. Born in Anson County, in 1892, Belvin Maynard was the first North Carolinian to become a world figure. In 1905, he moved with his family to Sampson County, and at an early age, well, he demonstrated an innate mechanical ability. And it was said that at 17 years of age, 
that he could take an automobile completely to pieces and put it back together with the greatest of ease. Yet despite his talent for all things mechanical, Maynard's passion was in the pulpit. He studied for the ministry at Delway School in Delway, North Carolina, and he was voted, quote, the best preacher by his peers. In 1913, Maynard married Essie Goodson, and a year later, he enrolled at Wake Forest College. Now, when America was thrust into World War I, Maynard was compelled to join the Army, and he withdrew from college. Well, because of his intelligence and mechanical skills, Maynard was placed in the Air Service, and he was sent to France. Well, there he achieved the rank of lieutenant, and he became a chief test pilot. Maynard tested hundreds of airplanes, and he was heralded for his flying abilities. At the end of the war, and just prior to leaving France, well, Maynard set a world record for completing 318 loop-the-loops in 67 minutes without <laughs> losing altitude. <laughs> Very impressive. Now, when Maynard returned back to North Carolina, well, he re-enrolled at Wake Forest, and he continued to serve in the aviation reserves. Now, he planned to complete his um, course of study, but a reliability air race that was going to take place from New York to Toronto caught his attention. The race was a competition that hoped to show the safety and commercial viability of airplanes. So as a result, he delayed his studies, he entered that race, and he won. Now, not long after, the press found out that Maynard was a Baptist preacher. So guess what they dubbed him? The Flying Parson. Now, in September 1919, Maynard once again returned to his studies. But then he left again in October to compete in the first transcontinental air race. It was a flight that would take him from New York to California and back again. Maynard's airplane was a de Havilland DH-4, which he christened Hello Frisco, and he flew on his flight by his skilled mechanic, which is Sergeant William Klein, seen on the right, and that cute little German Shepherd puppy, whose name was Trixie. The transcontinental air race was a new and dangerous undertaking. Many pilots died along the 5,400-mile route, while countless others endured non-fatal crashes and mechanical failures. Well, Maynard had his own share of problems, including hazardous storms, a blown radiator, and a flat tire. Yet, despite the difficulties, Maynard prevailed, and on October 19, 1919, he was declared the winner of the race. Well, Maynard's name was emblazoned on the front pages of newspapers across the country. He was, quote, the greatest pilot on earth and everyone in America knew his name. Now throughout the country, and particularly in North Carolina, parades and other festive events were held to honor their new national celebrity. And in November, Maynard flew to Raleigh, where he gave Gover Governor Thomas Walter Bickett his first ride in an airplane. And on takeoff, the governor shouted, give my regards to Lieutenant Governor Max Gardner, and tell him, go make the best governor he can be. <laughs> Obviously, he didn't think he was going to return. Well, the two men had planned to fly to Wake Forest for a reception, but the designated landing field was too short, so they had to return to Raleigh. Well, they eventually made it to the party, but it was by way of an automobile. How embarrassing. But in Sampson County, the field that had been plowed for Maynard's homecoming was found to be also inadequate. But against his better judgment, Maynard attempted to land because he didn't want to disappoint the crown. But when the airplane touched earth, the soft ground caught its tires, it cast its nose into the muck, and sent that tail skyward. Well, Maynard, Klein, and Trixie were unharmed, but the same could not be said for Hello Frisco. Now, there was a reporter at the scene, and he said, quote, the flying parson was not in good humor when he was greeted by the reception committee. But for his religious training, it is not improbable that he would have cussed. <laughs> well, that field, said Maynard, was not fit for a parachute jumper to land in. Well, such was the case throughout North Carolina. These so-called airfields dotted the landscape, but they were nothing more than golf courses, country club lawns, agricultural fields, 
and just other patches of land that had been cleared to allow space for landings and takeoffs. Now, although the majority of those fields were selected and put into shape by the government, most were plagued with stumps, ruts, and lots of mud. Now, the Winston-Salem Board of Trade, along with their supporters, well, they recognized these issues, and they made sure that their airfield was unlike any other in the state. And it was. At its completion, Maynard Field consisted of intersecting runways, which allowed flyers to take off and land from any direction. The field was cleared and smooth, the top surface was softened and compressed against the second layer, and a sandy sole, which prevented the accumulation of mud in bad weather, was spread over the top. Fifteen foot wide letters that spelled out Maynard Field were erected for the purpose of aerial navigation, and directional markers were posted at each end of the runways. A wind indicator was also erected on a 30-foot pole. In addition to safe and durable runways, Maynard Field also provided hangar space, gasoline, telephone service, and two parking spaces for automobiles. Now on December 6, 1919, the field was officially dedicated and Lieutenant Belvin W. Maynard was the first flyer to land on the runway. Unlike his landing in Saxon County, Maynard landed in smooth form and he found the field to be perfect in every regard. And when he addressed the crowd, Maynard said that Winston-Salem had taken the lead in the advancement of commercial aviation and encouraged its citizens to, quote, keep up the good work. The Winston-Salem Journal soon after reported that the city's, quote, fame as a pioneer in the science of aviation was spreading rapidly over the United States. And the popular magazine, Aerial Age Weekly, which was printed out of New York, well, they concurred. The magazine reported that Winston-Salem will go on record as being the first North Carolina city to establish a municipal field without government aid. An insight into the prestige gained through the move is seen in a letter received by Mayor Goral of Winston-Salem from the Boston Chamber of Commerce in which the intellectual metropolis of America asked advice on how it should go about securing a similar field. Now the famous aviators, Lieutenants Harry Runcer and Roscoe Turner, well they also publicized the success of Manor Field. Staunch promoters of commercial aviation the two men offered airplane rides to the public to demonstrate the safety of flight. They also traveled throughout the country performing aerial demonstrations and lecturing on the benefits of using airplanes in commercial ventures. Now at a lecture in Stanton, Virginia, the men said, if Stanton was an official landing place, your city would be shown on all aero maps and airmen would probably go out of their way to stop here knowing that there would be a good landing place and a supply of gas and oil. There is no established landing field for several hundred miles. Winston-Salem, however, has a fine airfield and it is a mecca for all airmen flying. Well, that mecca indeed put North Carolina and particularly Winston-Salem on those aero maps. Lieutenant Lindy Merrill, who served with the English and American Aero Squadrons during World War I, well, he hangered his airplane at Maynard Field from 1919 to 1920. Merrill stated that he had been attracted to the airfield after seeing the aero map that was issued. Now, when asked of his opinion of Maynard Field, Merrill said, Maynard Field is one of the best and safest fields for landing in the southeast and the people of Winston-Salem should be praised for their progressiveness in giving North Carolina the first private flying field accepted by the U.S. government. It was no wonder, he said, that Boston, cultured Boston, should write down to Winston-Salem to find out how to build an aviation field. Winston-Salem certainly used good judgment in preparing this field. It will give the city prestigious prestige in the aviation world that could not have been gained had they waited on Greensboro or some other city to take the initiative. Almost all aviators know of Winston-Salem. Now throughout the winter of 1919, Merrill offered airplane rides over Winston-Salem. The cost of the flight was $20. 
but for an additional $5, passengers could be treated to a loop or a tailspin. <laughs> Merrill's first customer and the first local citizen to fly out of Maynardfield was Mr. Carl M. Spry, and he was totally elated over his, quote, journey through the heavens. And when asked about his experience, well, Mr. Spry said that the sensation was delightful and that since the Prohibition Amendment had become effective, well, aviation now offered the only manner of, quote, getting high. <laughs> 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 Miss Louise Henley was the first local lady to fly out of Manor Field, and according to Wiss Journal, the fad, the fad spread quickly. Hordes of people were ready to board Merrill's Curtis airplane and ascend into the wild blue yonder. But before they did, however, they generally had two questions for their pilot. One, is it cold up there? To which he said, no colder than riding in the front seat of an automobile. And two, what will happen if the engine stops? To which Merrill replied, we'll just simply coast far enough to land. It's all safe. <laughs> but Maynard was created for more than aerial fun. Its purpose was to bring aviation businesses to Winston-Salem <coughs> and to prove the commercial viability of airplanes. On November 24, 1920, Harry Runcer and a Winston-Salem journalist, William Dull, flew out of Maynard Field with an airplane packed full of newspapers that were titled the Winston-Salem Air Messenger. Now these newspapers were specifically printed to promote air service in Winston-Salem, and they were dropped on all cities within a 60-mile radius. Runcer completed a circle of 250 miles while Dole tossed out the newspapers. Representatives were, wait were waiting in all surrounding counties to retrieve the papers and distribute them free of charge. And in each county, large groups of people chased underneath the airplane to see where the papers would land. It was another great step in the promotion of commercial aviation. Now, the day after they dropped out those newspapers, a large carnival was held at Maynard Field. The leaders of Winston-Salem went to great lengths to advertise the event, and in fact, it was promoted so largely that the carnival, quote, attracted attention to Winston-Salem from every nook and corner of the United States. Aviators from across the country landed at the field, including Monty Roth from the Augusta, Georgia Aviation Company. Well, Roth said when he got here, any city big enough and progressive enough to put on a show of this kind must be some city. So I came over to get acquainted. Well, Runcer and Turner were also there, and they decided to hold an air race over the city. Runcer's airplane outdistanced the others, and according to the Winston-Salem Journal, well, he took victory in the very first airplane race ever held in the state. The two men also thrilled spectators as they performed daring and dangerous feats of aviation. Now in one stunt, Turner stood on the wing of his airplane while Runcer performed a series of loop-the-loops. In another, he hung by his toes, or so they say, from the axle of his airplane as it plunged to the ground. Well, a young man from Winston-Salem witnessed the act, and he wrote in a letter to his friend, he said, One of the fellows who must have been weak in his upper story walked on the wings of the airplane while it was flying. Then he swung on the ladder underneath the plane. I bet his feet felt as if they were flying on reputation. Now, I want you to know that Maynard Field had become so popular that in December 1920, Santa Claus himself exchanged his sleigh for a quote, modern mechanical airbird. And he hangered it at Maynard Field. Now, I suppose the Winston-Salem Board of Trade never imagined that Maynard Field could accomplish such a miraculous feat, but it did. Gilmer's Incorporated, which was a general merchandise store, well, they hired the jolly old elf, along with Monty Roth, to fly to each of their 14 stores. Well, Gilmer's was determined to make the 1920 Christmas season the best, the happiest, and the most interesting in recent years. And they did, and Maynard Field became known as Santa's headquarters. <laughs> Two years later, however, in September 1922, a black cloud of sadness hovered over Maynard Field. While performing an aerial routine at a fair in Rutland, Vermont, 
Lieutenant Belvin W. Maynard's engine failed and his airplane dived into the ground. North Carolina's beloved son was dead. Now the flying parson enjoyed a short but eventful life, and such was the case for his namesake airfield too. Aerial activities continued to occur at Maynard Field for years after its creation. But in 1927, well, the field began its slow descent to closure. City leaders were informed that Charles Lindbergh, who had completed his first solo non-stop flight across the Atlantic, would be flying the Spirit of St. Louis to Winston-Salem as part of his nationwide tour. Well, because Maynard Field could not be expanded and the roads leading out to it were pretty bad, those progressive thinking Winston-Salem leaders decided that a new and more modern airport should be built. So a site was chosen off Liberty Street and Miller Municipal Field, which of course was renamed Smith Reynolds in 42, was quickly constructed. Now, although the new field greatly diminished the use of Maynard Field, it continued to operate throughout the 1930s. And of course, today, the area that was once the site of Maynard Field is covered by homes. Now, at the end of 1919, a newspaper reporter for the Winston-Salem Journal proudly stated that Winston-Salem would always be remembered for creating the very first commercial airfield in the state. Unfortunately, however, Maynard Field and its creation and all those behind it were forgotten. But that changed on May 18, 2008, when the Forsyth County Historic Resources Commission unveiled a marker honoring the achievements of Maynard Field and its progressive thinking citizens of Winston-Salem. On the day of its unveiling, members of the community, including one who had actually flown an airplane out of Maynard Field, well, they gathered at the site and recounted fond remembrances. For others, they learned about a place that they never knew existed. Now, in case you're wondering what happened to that little girl that I told you about in the beginning of the story, well, Libby Smith, and that's her right there, she grew up in the presence of Maynard Field. It was an integral part of her life. She witnessed a daily barrage of airplanes, and she had to walk across the field on her way to school. When she married, her husband built their home on a parcel of land that was located at the end of one of the Maynard Field runways. Levy never forgot her memories of Maynard Field, and she shared them freely throughout her 93 years. Now, remarkably, Levy loved to watch the airplanes, but her feet never left the ground. <laughs> now, there's a lot that has been learned about Maynard Field but there's also a lot more to be known. Maynard Field was a gathering place for local and professional photographers. And in fact, Russell and Moses, who were photographers out of Winston, well, they displayed photographs of Maynard Field in their gallery throughout the um, 1920. Now, none of those photographs have surfaced. I'm hoping one day they will. And if any of you have any photographs or information pertaining to Maynard Field, I would love to talk to you. But thank you again for your interest in Maynard Field and for coming out. <coughs> and if you have any questions, I would be happy to try and answer them. Does anyone have any questions? You, I think you said that this airfield was closer to Kurdish, no? Mm -hmm. And why was it considered to be against the sales? Well, it's still Winston today. It's just closer to that side of it. It's like where I live off Kernersville Road. I'm closer to Kernersville, so I do all my shopping in Kernersville. So I say I'm going to Winston because it's further up that way. So, yeah. The uh, runways mm -hmm. uh, that they talked about, uh, uh, I think seeing pictures and movies and whatever, uh, were they just would be grass. Uh, nothing that was, you know, uh, tarmac or whatever, paved. Yeah. Is that uh, kind of what the uh, construction was? Just the, the Well, with Maynard Field, what was most important about it was one that had intersecting runways. So, in like, at the time people were flying, they might could only come in and land from uh -huh. one way because they couldn't get back out this way, so they'd have to maneuver around. And also, yes, it was mostly just patches of grass, 
farmers would let flyers land in their fields, so they often, you know, would break their tires, break their propellers. <laughs> One of my flyers I did research on had to land in a field one time and she went smack dab into a manure pile and she broke her propeller into pieces. Um, but those things happen and so that's why Maynard Field, it was, it was just so um, modern for its time because it had the intersecting runways so you could come in and land from any direction, leave out of there any way you wanted to go. And yes, it had been, it was like the soil was all packed down and they you had said put it compacted and sand on top of it. Yeah. That's but right. And so it. that kept it tight and it didn't allow all the water and muck to build up on it. So it was generally always able to be landed on. You could, you could rely on that airfield, which was a big deal in 1919. Yeah. How far is the field from that marker that's on, on the highway? Out? Right across the street. Okay. Mm -hmm. That whole area. The whole area was Maynard Field. Where, where was it in relation to the old the, the field now? This way, how many miles? You mean between it and where Smith Reynolds is now? Between that and where we are, really. Oh, gosh. Just beyond Lindell Road. Yeah. It was just beyond oh. Lindell Road, okay, okay. Yeah, so that's not, that's only a couple that's, of miles. No, that's not far. Either. Yeah, maybe five miles, would you say, probably? Yeah. Yeah, not far at all. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say uh, I'm a volunteer ambassador at the Piedmont Triad International you? Airport, and it's changed a lot. Things have changed quite a bit, <laughs> <laughs> and continue. But uh, it's interesting. Uh, I'm not a spokesman for the airport uh, by any means, but uh, uh, with their expansion, uh, they're <coughs> continuously uh, promoting and uh, bringing in companies that uh, are involved with the air, because FedEx and uh, Honda and, and whatever, but uh, other places that make parts and whatever, they're looking forward to bringing in in the uh, future. So it, uh, we're still uh, a very vibrant uh, air, uh, commercial air area, but yeah. uh, the problem is that with the new uh, uh, the airlines uh, drawing down into just a few major airlines, we have a very difficult time uh, getting uh, other airlines, getting more uh, availability of flights in and out and direct flights and whatever. It's, uh, that's a constant uh, uh, promoting that, that is being done by the management of the airport. So, Right, and airplanes have come a long ways in a very yeah. short period of time. Yeah. And to think Winston Salem was ahead of the game. <laughs> Way ahead of that game. Yeah. Is the uh, uh, Reynolds Company do any things with this airport? Do they with Maynard Field? Yeah. No. Okay. Was just, I think that's another thing, too, that makes Maynard Field so special. Because when the people in Winston Salem found out they had the opportunity, you have to remember at that time too, Winston Salem was the, the largest city in North Carolina. We were the city of industry. So they were always doing everything they could to attract every business and be the best they could be. But it was the local volunteers. I mean, there were no major companies that sent in the, the equipment that had to be used to plow out the fields and stuff. That was all local people who lived right around in that area who came together. They didn't gain anything from it, not monetarily. Mm -hmm. They just knew that they were contributing to something that was really important for their city. So I think that says a lot about Manorfield because we just, we don't do that anymore. You know, you're going to use my equipment, you're going to pay for it. But no, they were so excited about it, they just all came together and, and made the thing work in a very short period of time. Yeah. It was just great on all accords. <laughs> <laughs> I love that place. Levy was my grandmother. So I researched the field um, for about 10 years. I tried to get the historic marker um, through the state, but the state thought that the marker was important to the city, but not to the state. So fortunately, Forsyth County thought well of it, and we erected the marker in 2008. So it's just terrible for something to have been there, and most people who live or live on that property never even knew what was what was there. <coughs> And it was very important that we did that. Yeah. Anybody else? If I were driving uh -huh. down toward Lindell Road, mm -hmm. where would I see the marker? 
Well, right after you pass Linville Road, there's a church. It's St. Jagarin Baptist Church. And right after the church, you just look straight to the right, and you're going to see that sign standing there. Mm -hmm. It's right there. And, and you can even pull in. There's plenty of area you can just pull in and step out and read it. And the second street to the left is uh, Mayor Drive. That's right. Mm -hmm. And that, that's right. That's the side that the field was on. Yep. Good. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Welcome to stick around, check out, because I know everyone's very, oh, excuse me. No, no, I'm going to say something before we left. Oh, after the questions. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, I'm going to turn it over to Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> Just for a moment. Sure. I just wanted to invite all of you to the Historic Preservation Meeting, which will be next Monday at the Historic Chapel of the Moravian Church. This is their 150th year anniversary, so we will be having our program there and looking at Moravians 150 years ago, and we want to invite everyone to come. It will be at 6.30 at the Moravian Church, the Historic Chapel, so please come. Thank you, Jessica. This has been very interesting. Yes. Yes. And I highly recommend the Historical Society's lectures. It's always incredibly informative, and just the stories you tell them are amazing. So. I encourage everyone to come on Monday as well. <laughs> so you guys are welcome to, to stick around, ask more questions. Like I said, the books are set up over in there. Don't everybody all run at once. It's a small doorway. But I do want to thank you guys all for coming and enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you. Thank you.